So uh, between filming the last part and filming this one, a dollar store opened in my hometown and I checked it out and they had these little, little superhero minifigures, which I'm going to, yeah, yeah, just make a mess as you decorate that. There, there, now I have a Superman to stare down Batman in my little UI on the screen. And you might say, hey, Batman, the, those don't uh, go together. Batman's like a Funko Pop, but don't worry. Because I also got a Batman one, so now there's two Batmen, which is which is good, because then that's double the contingency plans. See there. Let, let's start the video. This is a dumb bit. So anyway, this is part two of a two-part video. Go watch the first part first. There's a link in the description, or don't watch it, I guess. I don't know. I'm not your dad. TLDR, Batman makes a lot of plans to defeat other superheroes. Half of them are too stupid to work, and the other half are flat-out murder. In the last part, I focused heavily on the JLA story Tower of Babel by Mark Waid, which introduced the idea that Batman has contingencies for a bunch of different heroes. Of course, Tower of Babel didn't invent the idea that Batman can beat other heroes through his intelligence. That idea was really cemented by Frank Miller in The Dark Knight Returns, a story that ends with Batman beating Superman, sorta, kinda, not really. The Dark Knight Returns takes place in a dark future where Ronald Reagan isn't dead. Terrifying, I know. Also, all of the superheroes but Superman have been forced into retirement. Batman decides to resume Batmaning, but the new police commissioner orders his arrest. Clark meets with Bruce and asks him to retire again, both for his health and because, eventually, someone with authority will ask Superman to bring him in. Batman says, may the best man win. As a side note, I really kind of hate this characterization of Superman. Superman should fight for the ideals of truth and justice, not for the violent government that hates those ideals. The United States government is an abomination that exists primarily to carry out war crimes and protect the fortunes of the billionaire ruling class. But in The Dark Knight Returns, Superman is steadfastly loyal to Ronald Reagan and the American government. I'm not going to pretend that this is something exclusive to Miller. For example, in Legends, a crossover event that came out the same year as The Dark Knight Returns, Ronald Reagan outlaws superheroes. Superman meets with him as a representative of the superhero community and agrees to stand down. Superman being beholden to the government isn't something Miller invented. It's just something that he's really obnoxious about. Then again, to be fair in Legends, Superman doesn't go out and arrest his fellow heroes when they tell Ronald Reagan to piss off. He just sits there in the Oval Office saying, Oh no, that's terrible. I can't believe they're ignoring your orders, sir. And he does fight alongside the others at the end against Reagan's orders. Still, it's really uncomfortable to read a story where everyone is super chummy with Reagan that came out at the height of the AIDS crisis. Like, Martian Manhunter saves Reagan's life and shakes his hand instead of punching him in the face and banishing him to the Phantom Zone. People talk about how Batman should break his no-killing rule for the Joker because the Joker has killed so many people, but Legends features a supervillain so deadly he makes the Joker's kill count laughable, and Batman doesn't even try to stop him. Jokes about killing Ronald Reagan aside, I can understand why Superman and the other big superheroes don't kill the president and take over the world. Superman possesses all the power in the world and faces constant inner turmoil over what to do with that power. He often falls back to being more restrained out of a fear of going too far. He only does what is unquestionably good, because he knows he is capable of becoming a mass-murdering dictator. I'm not going to knock a guy with infinite power for deciding to limit his control over other people. Still, when written right, Superman would never even consider attacking his fellow heroes just because Mr. President said he had to. And that is the subtle nuance to Superman's character that Frank Miller used to kind of understand before he stuck his head into a microwave and melted his brain. Side note, there is a moment in Legends where Firestorm survives being hit by a blast of fire by transmuting all of the air into asbestos. That's your age poorly. Anyway, in The Dark Knight Returns, Superman works with the government because it allows him to continue being a hero, even after superheroes have been outlawed. After Russia decides to nuke a small island nation because they're evil, and also because Frank Miller has a toddler's understanding of geopolitics, Superman grabs the nuke and diverts it to the desert. 
saving 25 million lives in the process. The Dark Knight Returns works better than Miller's other work featuring Superman because even though Superman is antagonistic, he's still Superman. He's still a hero. The nuke is a special bomb called the Coldbringer that causes nuclear winter and sets off an EMP that reaches Gotham. The Coldbringer almost kills Superman, with him barely surviving by absorbing the sunlight in a flower. It can thus be assumed that Superman isn't operating at full strength for the rest of the story. The geopolitical implications of Russia firing a nuclear missile are forgotten about almost immediately because this is a story about how Batman is, like, really, really cool. Gotham descends into a blackout caused chaos, which isn't actually something that would happen in real life. In real life, people are usually chill during blackouts because of fucking course they are. Anyway, some violent gangsters Batman arrested earlier in the story break out of prison, so Batman recruits them into being an army under his command and takes control of the city. I am the law! Reagan doesn't like the fact that a violent vigilante wanted for murder and his army of convicted murderers conquered a major city, so he sends Superman to arrest Batman. Instead of just blitzing Batman, Superman tells him about the fight in advance and gives him a few hours to prepare. They meet in Crime Alley. Batman is wearing a suit of power armor because that's the only way he could stand a chance. Batman hits Superman with missiles and a tank. Superman shrugs them off and destroys the tank. Batman hits Superman with a sonic gun and all of Gotham's power, which stuns him and allows Batman to get the iconic punch panel in. Superman rips off Batman's helmet, but doesn't use this opportunity to hit Batman in the face, because that would kill him instantly. Batman blinds Superman briefly with some hand goo, which gives Green Arrow an opportunity to shoot him with an exploding kryptonite arrow. Batman gets in a few good blows, then collapses and dies of a heart attack. So to recap, in this story... Batman beats Superman after Superman has been hit by a nuke during nuclear winter while wearing power armor with Green Arrow's help while Superman was holding back. And also, by beat Superman, I mean he punches Superman till Superman goes down and then he has a heart attack and dies. Truly, Batman's contingency plans are incredibly intelligent. He could beat anyone. The plan is okay, but it requires help and only works because Superman is weakened and holding back. Except, for some reason, this comic made everyone think Batman could easily kick Superman's ass, even though the fight in the book is far from one-sided. Also, Superman notices that Batman is still alive at the funeral, and could have very easily beat up a very injured Batman, but he lets him go, because Frank Miller used to be a passable writer. Batman and Superman have a rematch in the sequel to The Dark Knight Returns. The Dark Knight Strikes- OH GOD! OH GOD! OH GOD THE ARC IS SO BAD! LOOK AT THIS SHIT! WHERE IS BATMAN'S TORSO?! HOW DID YOU FORGET TO GIVE BATMAN A TORSO?! Like, Returns was stylized, but back then Frank Miller knew how to use stylization to get across emotional moments. This- this is just bad! I have never seen a comic that looks as terrible as The Dark Knight Strikes Back. Well, maybe the writing is good? What? What's that? It's worse? How is that even possible? It's revealed that Luther and Brainiac are holding the city of Kandor hostage. Superman does whatever they say because Miller hates Superman, and I guess retroactively, this is why he worked for Reagan and Returns, because who needs nuanced characters. Batman has Carrie Kelly break Flash and the Atom out of prison, so Superman breaks into the Batcave and hits the T-Rex with his dangerous Photoshop pixelation attack! Batman is well prepared for this fight. Flash covers soups and bombs, Batman drops 90 tons of rock on him, Green Arrow fires another kryptonite arrow, Adam punches him in the inner ear, and Batman punches him in the face with giant kryptonite hulk fists. As far as plans go, having four different superheroes rush Superman down and attack him with kryptonite is a pretty good plan. I don't know what Batman would have done if Wonder Woman or Captain Marvel came along, but just having a bunch of people hit Superman really hard is a solid scheme. And I would talk about what happens afterwards in this book, but blood comes out of my nose and I feel really tired whenever I think about Superman's characterization in The Dark Knight Strikes Again. Of course, Superman isn't the only hero Frank Miller hates. He also hates Wonder Woman. For example, look at her introduction in All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder, where she acts like what gamer gators think feminists act like. 
an ass bar. Superman and the League hate Batman because he kidnapped a child and that made the public hate superheroes. Honestly, this type of behavior is probably what led to superheroes being outlawed in this continuity. Green Lantern says, hold on, we don't know for sure that he kidnapped a child. And Hal's right that they don't know, but I do. He kidnapped Dick Grayson, then locked him in his basement, and forced him to eat rats. I really hate how Frank Miller writes Batman. Wonder Woman says that they should hunt down and brutally murder Batman. Superman threatens to kill her, and Wonder Woman says, You bastard! You bastard! I hate your guts! I hate your guts! You make me sick! You make me sick! A lot of characters written by Miller are basically Johnny Two Times from Goodfellas. Then she starts making out with Superman. Then Batman murders a bunch of crooked cops and has sex with Black Canary next to their burning corpses. Hal, being the only superhero who isn't an asshole, goes to talk with Batman. Batman monologues about how he hates Green Lantern because he has the power to take over the world and doesn't. Batman lets Hal meet him in an apartment in 12 hours. When Hal shows up, the entire apartment is painted yellow, as is Batman. According to Batman's monologue, this took him and Robin 11 hours. Batman offers Hal lemonade. This is it. This is the greatest thing Frank Miller has ever written. This is better than The Dark Knight Returns. Watching Robin rush to catch a falling glass of lemonade while Green Lantern beats the shit out of yellow-painted Batman is peak literature. This is so stupid that it wraps around to being genius. Unfortunately for Hal, Robin steals his ring from ten feet away between panels without him noticing... somehow. Robin beats up Green Lantern, but Batman abuses him to stop him from killing Hal. After the ambulance arrives, Batman monologues about how he enjoyed almost murdering Hal, then feels bad about it and cries in a cemetery. Hot cake, Aspar is better than Strikes Again, solely because of Jim Lee's art. The writing is atrocious, but so is the writing in Strikes Again, and at least I can understand what's happening from panel to panel. Aspar is only the third worst Batman story Miller ever wrote. What's the worst, you ask? That's... that's best left for a different video. This is a video about Batman's contingencies, and his contingency for Green Lantern is so fucking stupid! It only works because Miller makes every character he doesn't like act like an idiot. Do you know what Hal would have done in mainline comics? Walked outside and chucked the Batmobile through the wall. The idea that Batman could beat up Green Lantern because, uh, uh, he's weak to yellow and that's dumb, is laughable. Hal has dealt with the color yellow before. His arch enemy is a guy who wears a yellow costume and he consistently kicks his ass. There is no reason Hal couldn't beat Batman wearing a yellow costume, and it needs to be understood that this epic plan requires Batman to have 12 hours of prep time. The Batman had to run away and spend an entire day painting an apartment yellow to stand a chance against Green Lantern. The fact that Frank Miller hasn't written anything even remotely good in 20 years has not stopped his older work from being incredibly influential. Both Christopher Nolan and Zack Snyder based movies off Miller's works. Snyder in particular made a partial adaptation of The Dark Knight Returns and was sure to include the most important aspect of Miller's writing, Batman and Superman acting like assholes. Like, you know how The Dark Knight Returns' climax kinda hinges on the fact that Superman and Batman used to be friends and the fact that Superman still respects Batman? Fuck all of that, let's have them fight as soon as they meet. Batman hates Superman because he witnessed how powerful Kryptonians are during Man of Steel and got mixed up on which Christian Bale role he was supposed to be imitating. That's, that's a Dick Cheney joke for you guys in the audience, in case that wasn't clear. On the other hand, Superman hates Batman because Batman is a murderer, like a violent, violent murderer. I mean, Superman also killed Zod, but at least he was sad over it. Ben Affleck's Batman is Aspar-level violent. Lex kidnaps Superman's mom and blackmails him into attacking Batman. Batman is waiting for Superman and is fully prepared to kill him because, again, violent, remorseless murderer. Before the fight, Batman steals some kryptonite from Lex and carves it into a big-ass spear. He leaves it hidden in this abandoned building, then walks outside to fight Superman, and you may be asking, why? Why did he leave his wing condition out of reach? Because, if Batman had the spear, the fight would have been over too quickly. That's why. Also, he has power armor like in The Dark Knight Returns, which is something I've never liked. The debate is, could Batman beat Superman? Not, could Batman beat Superman if he was Iron Man? 
Superman, who is the mature adult in the situation only by comparison, doesn't try to explain shit. He walks up to Batman and shouts, You don't understand! There's no time! And slaps Batman 30 feet away. He then slowly walks up to Batman and doesn't bother to use that time to say literally anything. Batman tries sonic devices and guns, which don't do jack shit. Fortunately, he has a kryptonite gas grenade launcher, which weakens Superman for a few minutes, allowing him to get in a few good blows. Then the gas wears off, allowing Superman to beat up Batman for a while. Batman eventually remembers that he brought a second grenade. Instead of dodging it, Superman flies in a straight line at Batman while he reloads, allowing Batman to knock him out with a toilet. Batman drags Superman to the spear, something that takes several minutes, and again, WHY THE HELL DID HE LEAVE IT THERE?! And I know it's big and unwieldy, but here's an idea. Instead of a spear, how about a knife? Batman could have won five minutes ago if he wasn't an idiot. Superman finally remembers that he speaks English, but still doesn't explain shit. He says, You're letting him kill Martha! Find him! Save <coughs> Martha! This actually gets through to Batman because his mom was named Martha. This scene is so clunky and dumb. Why would he say Martha instead of my mother? But, to be honest, this scene is the best part of the movie, and one of the only times Batman v Superman actually works as a movie. Batman realizing Superman's humanity by being reminded of his mother's murder is a great idea, and it's shot and acted pretty well. The only problem is the dialogue, which is just so dumb. Want an even spicier hot take? Jesse Eisenberg gives this film's best performance and was good as Lex Luthor. Unfortunately, he gives that performance in a mediocre pile of sludge that thinks it's deep, but doesn't actually have anything to say about anything. For example, is it bad that Batman kills people? That's why Superman hates him, except after their fight, he still brutally murders a bunch of men and is portrayed as heroic. Is it a movie about how we shouldn't treat Superman like a god? Then why is his death a Jesus parallel? Is it a movie about Superman's humanity, or about how he's a special alien savior? Is it about... Oh, that's my you bitched about Zack Snyder for too long in the comment section sucks now alarm. Let's talk about something else. In the The Batman series finale, Lost Powers, all of the Justice League members except Batman and Green Arrow are kidnapped by aliens who steal their powers and give them to robots. Batman gives the League his contingencies so they can take out their robot doubles. Superman is given a kryptonite laser, Green Lantern is given a gun that shoots yellow powder, and Flash is given the big sticky mess, a grenade launcher that shoots cool foam! Hawkman gets an electrified net, and Martian Manhunter gets a fire laser. All of these specialty guns fail almost immediately. Hawkbot and Robot Manhunter recover quickly and attack their counterparts. The big sticky mess holds flash drive until he begins stomping hard enough to shatter the street. The yellow powder is surprisingly effective, but Green Land Terminator jumps into a fountain and washes it off. The kryptonite laser stuns the Man of Steel, but it doesn't take away his heat vision, allowing him to throw Superman off a building. Fortunately, Robin realizes that the big targets on the robot's chest are video game boss weak points, which the League exploits. The Superman, Martian, and Hawkman counters are lame, but the Flash counter did hold the robot down for a while, and the Lantern counter can at least be used again if the powder gets washed off. All in all, this episode's counters are boring, but not the worst. In the animated adaptation of The New Frontier, they added a scene where Batman warns Martian Manhunter that he has a $70,000 sliver of radioactive meteor to deal with Superman, but to deal with him, Batman only needs a one-cent book of matches. This is a cool line that scares Jean, but also, that is a really underbaked plan. Then again, Batman is probably exaggerating. An extra issue of the New Frontier comic came out as a tie-in to the movie version. The issue is called the New Frontier Animated Special, but was written and illustrated by Darwin Cook, who created the comic version. So, which continuity does this take place in? Don't worry about it. At the start, Rip Hunter says who cares what continuity it takes place in after murdering an aluminum siding salesman. The first story begins with that massive donger King Faraday asking Superman and Wonder Woman to arrest Batman. He asks them this at a meeting on Bruce Wayne's yacht, for some reason. Like, I get that it's neutral territory and Batman wants to spy on the meeting, but how did he find out about this? Whatever. Wonder Woman says no, but Superman receives extra encouragement from Dwight Eisenhower, who explains that the country was founded by men with the purpose and clarity to see past the immediate comfort of the few while looking up at an authoritarian white supremacist bastard who stripped others of basic liberties and human decency to protect his own personal comfort and money. 
Hey, speaking of presidents, I wonder if the coups in Iran and Guatemala count as things that ran counter to the greater good. Superman says the bad man is a force for good, but Eisenhower says that you can't just let some outlaw run around breaking laws unless they're the president. Then they're allowed to break the law and commit violent crimes as a treat. I don't like presidents, okay? Superman sees the bat signal coming out of a junkyard filled with lead-covered cars. Batman fires missiles, which Superman easily dodges. Then covers him in a bunch of toxic foam, too horrific for even the U.S. Army to use. And I mean, too toxic for the army? Add this to the list of contingencies that are definitely war crimes. Batman drops 60 tons of cars on Superman and drives away. This holds Superman for one entire panel. Batman races back to the Batcave, temporarily blinding Superman with oil to keep him from destroying the car. Batman stuns Superman with a sonic blast and shoots him with a kryptonite harpoon and tries to drag him into a high-tech cage while riding on a motorcycle. Superman grabs the ground and the motorcycle slides out from under Batman. Superman grabs Batman by the throat, but Wonder Woman breaks up the fight. The trio decide to be friends and stage a fight where Superman loses. This plan is not very good. Batman attacks Superman at the junkyard, even though his wing condition is at the Batcave. And said wing condition involves hitting Superman with a harpoon and dragging him into a cage. There isn't really any indication that the cage would work either. At this point, I'd like to mention one contingency I skipped last time by mistake. Flash's counter from Justice League Online. Paralysis? That, that's it. Paralysis question mark. That isn't a plan, Batman! Also, after I filmed the last part, a new game came out featuring contingencies. Suicide Squad. Kill the Justice League. In this game, Brainiac mind controls the League into working for him, so Amanda Waller sends the Suicide Squad into, uh, let me check my notes here, Kill the Justice League. Squad takes out Green Lantern using a contingency stolen from Batman. Sinestro core battery thingies that allow the team to deal extra damage against Green Lantern. This is similar to the anti-speed force tech Toy Man made, which allows the team's guns to do extra damage to the Flash, and the gold kryptonite Luther made that allows the team to do extra damage to Superman. This contingency is lame. Like, it isn't even a contingency, it's just a reskin for gameplay purposes. The yellow lantern guns allow the squad to destroy John's constructs and eventually take him out by just shooting him a bunch. This plan would not work for Batman because it took four people with guns to take down Green Lantern. Later in the game, the team break into the Batcave and find a recording left for Robin, where Batman explains his contingencies. The team fast forward past Flash's counter because he's already dead, although I assume it would be something similar to what Toy Man made. Batman's counter is he did not make a counter for himself. Batman also notes that to defeat the Justice League, they need to work together! Superman's counter is cut off when Batman attacks the Suicide Squad. Harley kills him by shooting him in the head. This is a great ending to the Arkham series. I especially like that the game just kind of ends without any climax, because that's being saved for a live service DLC. Let's jump back to mainline comics. In the new 52 storyline Forever Evil, written by Jeff Johns, the other members of the Justice League are trapped within Firestorm by their evil alternate counterparts, the Crime Syndicate. The nice thing about writing Firestorm is that literally no one understands how his powers actually work, so you can just say, uh, they're trapped in Firestorm until Batman can reverse the polarity of the linear particle accelerator ionized neutrinos, and fans will just shrug and say, sure. Batman takes Catwoman to the Batcave and shows off his contingencies for the original members of the New 52 League. And only the original members. This is a problem because the Crime Syndicate has Firestorm, Adam, and Shazam equivalents who Batman does not have any plan for. Batman says he isn't proud of his contingencies, which at least is a sign he's grown as a person. Superman's counter is the classic kryptonite ring, which we've already discussed, Although this plan is actually worse in Forever Evil than normally. Batman's trying to use it on Ultraman, who is strengthened by Kryptonite. Can we fault Batman for this? Maybe? Like, you learned in Infinite Crisis that Kryptonite doesn't work on people from other universes, except I don't know if he did learn that, because the New 52 fucked up continuity. Green Lantern's counter is a Sinestro Core ring that barely has any charge left. You might recall the fact that Green Lantern consistently beats Sinestro. I don't know why Batman would assume that he could beat Green Lantern by using Sinestro's powers, except with less training with only a really small battery. This is the only one of these plans Batman actually gets to try, and it fails immediately. The ring runs out of power, then evil Green Lantern smashes it. Batman actually ends up surviving, though, because Sinestro shows up, pissed that someone stole his ring, and chops off Harold's arm with a buzzsaw. So, success? 
After almost dying to the lamest member of the crime syndicate, Batman reluctantly teams up with Luthor and a team of supervillains who all hate the syndicate for various reasons. Flash's counter is a lightning rod from the future that might be able to slow him down by draining his interdimensional energy. I don't have any idea how that works, so I'll just shrug and say sure. This one isn't actually used against Flash's counterpart, he's the few when Captain Cold freezes and shatters his leg, but the lightning rod is used against an alternate version of Lex Luthor who has Shazam's powers. Luthor has Sinestro stab his alternate, Alexander, with the rod, so he'll be hit and depowered when Black Adam shouts Shazam. Except Alexander's word isn't Shazam, it's Mazaz, because he's from the wacky backwards world. But it's fine, because Lex and Alexander have the same vocal cords, allowing Luthor to depower Alexander and kill him. Also, Luthor kills Adam's counterpart by just stepping on her, so I guess Batman didn't need a plan after all. Cyborg's counter is a mother box, which might work because Cyborg's powers are mother box based, except Batman admits he doesn't know how to use it. Aquaman's plan isn't shown because the crime syndicate Aquaman is dead. Batman opens up the marked box containing Wonder Woman's counter, revealing that it does not exist. Batman not only could not come up with a new plan, he didn't even think to reuse his old VR plan. Like, when Batman didn't have a plan for the Apocalypse characters, that's because he couldn't think of one. But this scene is a follow-up to Tower of Babel, and Batman had a plan in that book! And it isn't like Rocket Red, where Batman doesn't respect his opponent enough to have a plan. Batman knows Wonder Woman is really, really strong, but he still has absolutely no plan. Forever Evil is one of the better stories I read for this project, but unfortunately, it's primarily a story about Lex Luthor, so rambling about how much I like his and Bizarro's character moments is a bit of a waste of time. Kind of like spending so much of the last video talking about how cool Connor Kent is. The second most famous example of Batman winning with contingencies besides Tower of Babel is Batman Endgame written by Scott Snyder. The story begins with Batman describing the literary concept of a deus ex machina, and this is very on the nose, but it does tie into the fact that Batman takes on the Justice League, people who are essentially gods, by using technology. It also ties into the fact that this story relies on random ass pulls to keep Batman from dying. The story proper begins with Batman, who is already injured from a previous story, being attacked out of costume by Wonder Woman. She smashes him into the floor, and I'm going to stop right now, because Batman should be dead. Batman cannot survive being hit by Wonder Woman when she isn't holding back. Batman gets his hand on his utility belt before Diana flies out the window with him, and puts some magnets on her head, which stun her, causing her to drop him. 100 feet onto a convenient tree, which keeps him from dying, I guess? That is the third least realistic time Batman survived falling from a high height. Batman runs away screaming and has Alfred fill most of Gotham with smoke, which probably caused some car crashes, which buys him time to put on a suit of Hulkbuster armor. The Hulkbuster armor, actually called the Fenrir suit, allows Batman to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wonder Woman, who isn't holding back except, yes she is, see the scene where she hit him out of costume and didn't kill him. The Fenrir suit is a good general counter for members of the Justice League. Being strong and tough enough to not die instantly is pretty important if you want to still be alive when you pull out your hyper-specific contingency. I went back and forth on whether or not I should include this or the Dark Knight Returns suit on this list, but then I realized that the good plan section of the conclusion was really short, so... It's, uh, it's going on the list. Wonder Woman cuts apart the armor and kills Batman, but then it's revealed that this is actually a dream induced by the antithesis of Wonder Woman's Lasso of Truth, a magic rope created by Hephaestus that traps people on illusions. This continues in the VR tradition from Tower of Babel and Doom, but I do like it being magic linked to Diana's lasso more than Batman having random ass mind control brain robots. Flash shows up next, and Batman explains that the suit costs more money than 60% of the world's nations put into their respective militaries, and that seems like a lot, but remember, most military spending is heavily concentrated in a few countries. The United States spends $750 billion on the military because murdering children in Palestine is a more efficient way to protect the lives of Americans than making health care affordable or housing homeless people. The second biggest spender, China, spends less than a third of that, and no other countries even come close to breaking the $100 billion threshold. There are a little under 200 different countries, meaning the biggest country in terms of military spending that Batman is talking about is Lithuania, who spend a paltry 1.11 billion per year, and I mean, that's a lot! But that's, what, the cost of 6 F-35s? 
excluding the massive design costs? And considering how good this suit does against Superman and Wonder Woman, who tear through fighter planes like tissue paper? That's a bargain! Maybe Batman means the bottom 60% put together, but military spending gets lower and lower as you go down the list. That's still only a little over 20 billion, based on my math, which, I mean, is far, 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 far more money than any human should be allowed to have, but not for a suit that allows Batman to defeat planet-destroying demigods. Goddamn. Looking at this chart has really made it clear how fucking absurd American military spending is. And even with all that spending, the US military still gets their asses kicked constantly. Speaking of getting their asses kicked, Batman's solution for Flash is to hope he runs in a straight line at him, then shoot a slippery coating onto the ground. I take it back, Batman spent too much money. Captain Cold can do this with a gun he made out of parts he stole from a hardware store. And he doesn't need a supercomputer to calculate the angle, because Flash always runs in a straight line. Aquaman shows up and gets defeated in a single page. Batman shoots him with a water-absorbent foam, which restrains him and draws out all of his moisture. The Pennyworths warn that a new challenger is approaching, Batman mentions that he has an electromagnetic nerve tree for Cyborg, and a Citrine Neuralizer for Green Lantern, and I don't think even Scott Snyder knew what those were. But of course, the approaching threat is the one person Batman is afraid to fight. Superman slams Batman through the Deus Ex Machina, and is revealed that the Justice League are being mind-controlled by the Joker. Mind control is really easy to invent in the DC Universe, I guess. Batman whips out mini Red Sun brass knuckles and gets a few good blows in. Superman tries heat vision, which is stopped by a plasma shield, except plasma shield fails when Superman drops a building on Batman, allowing him to melt the gauntlet. Superman tears off the armor and flies Batman a mile into the sky. Batman has one last trick up his sleeve. Kryptonite gum, which he keeps in his mask at all times. Isn't kryptonite, like, super radioactive? I don't think keeping a chunk of it next to your face is a good idea, Bats. That's how you get cancer. Anyway, the gum knocks out Superman, causing him to... Drop Batman into the ocean. From a mile in the air. He is completely fine afterwards. This is the second least realistic time Batman has survived falling from a high height. Batman spends the rest of the story fighting the Joker, who is able to trick him by frowning and wearing makeup because falling onto his head so much has left Batman a bit dumb. At this point, I was originally going to discuss every single different Batman and Superman fight from over the years, but then I looked into it and discovered that they have fought literally dozens of times. Every article or forum thread I found featured new fights because DC writers love this plot point. Back in 2016, Imaginary Axis made the most complete list I've seen with 45 different fights, and I know for a fact that that one is incomplete because it didn't feature the New Frontier special, Infinite Crisis, or any fight from the last eight years like Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. A lot of the fights Imaginary Axis described are just Superman is mind-controlled, Batman holds his own for a while thanks to kryptonite and power armor, or Batman gets superpowers and becomes evil, then Superman beats him. Very few of them feature what this video is about, the overcomplicated contingency plans. Batman has gotten a few good wins over the years, but they usually have heavy caveats, like in Strikes Again where Batman has help, or in the feud between Batman and Superman where Batman beats a powerless Superman in a sparring match. In the rare times where they do have a fair fight, like in Justice League Origins or especially in Superman's Sacrifice, Superman wins easily. Ultimately, I decided to skip this section because I didn't want to just remake someone else's video, but worse. I mean, he skipped the Silver Age stuff, so maybe I could talk about that in another video. Actually, I will do that because I've read some of the Silver Age stuff and it is wild. Highlights include Batman and Superman shooting each other with real guns and the bullets colliding mid-air, and that time Batman got turned into Mega Mind and became evil. Anyway, the point is Superman could kick Batman's ass, and no story demonstrates this idea better than the Justice League arc The Sixth Dimension, written by Scott Snyder and Jorge Jimenez. At this point in the comics, the Legion of Doom is trying to reawaken Perpetua, the evil goddess who created the multiverse, something that will surely not blow up in their faces. Perpetua wants to fill the multiverse with evil so she can turn it into a weapon to use on other omniversal deities. The League is contacted by a future version of Superman who offers to bring them to the future and tell them how to save the universe. The future is a perfect utopia and they're doing a Justice Lords. This is a Justice Lords, right? Isn't it? Okay, yeah. Future Superman teleports present Superman to a dead planet in a starless galaxy in a pocket universe so he can die. Yeah, they're, they're doing the Justice Lords. Who could have seen that coming?
Cooperman explains a bunch of lore I don't have time to recap and explains that they stopped Perpetua by destroying the multiverse and remaking it into a perfect world. Dick Grayson, now Batman, explains that future Batman sacrificed himself to create the Utopia. Batman, of course, asks the obvious question. Where the hell are all of the villains? It cuts away before they answer, so I imagine Dick and Fooperman just stood there awkwardly until Batman stopped asking. It's revealed that Fooperman is actually Alpheus the World Forger, Perpetua's son who sealed her away billions of years ago. He wants to replace the old multiverse with a new one filled with justice to stop his mother and keep the other outer gods from destroying everything. Where are all the villains? In a massive prison that contains trillions of people, half of the entire multiverse. The World Forger wants the Justice League, the greatest heroes his multiverse ever produced, to help him. Superman would never go along with this, so WF locked him away. The League is disgusted by the mass arrests and refuses to join the World Forger. Except Batman, who thinks he has a point. The League are sent to a super prison. Meanwhile, Superman tries to escape the Dark World. The World Forger explains that he left Superman a single distant star to keep him alive. He hands Batman the computer he uses to move stars, and Batman realizes this is a test. The World Forger wants him to kill Superman to stop him from escaping. With a heavy heart, Batman moves the star, leaving Superman stranded in darkness. The World Forger gives Batman his ultimate contingency plan, the final Batsuit, a suit of armor that future Batman created that not only makes him as strong as the rest of the League, but allows him to rewrite minds. And yeah, that's a good contingency. How do you stop a mind-controlled Wonder Woman? Free her with stronger mind control. The League is freed by Darkseid and the future Legion of Doom. They make it back to Earth and face off against their mind-controlled future selves and Batman as the World Forger prepares to swing his hammer and reforge reality. World Forger orders Batman to mind-control the rest of the League, and Batman says, Hold on, let me talk to them first and convince them to join you, something they're definitely gonna do. The future bat suit allows Batman to fight the League to a standstill. He shouts, Please, I'm trying to help you see the light! He isn't talking to them. He's talking to Superman. In case it wasn't obvious, Batman didn't actually betray the team. When he moved the star, he actually moved it and thousands of other stars closer to Superman. Focusing on the memories he has of his father, his son, and his team, Superman reaches the first star. Then, he absorbs power from it, and every other star Batman left him. He moves at a speed beyond physics and crosses the entire goddamn universe in a few seconds. The World Forger swings his hammer, but Superman hits him first, hard enough to shatter the new multiverse. We've talked about Batman with prep time, but this is Superman with prep time. Superman with prep time can absorb the energy of every star in the sky, then one-shot a multiversal god, and destroy 50 entire universes with a single punch. But it doesn't really matter who's stronger, does it? There are so, so, so many stories about Superman and Batman fighting, but honestly, a lot of those stories are really, really mediocre. But the ending of The Sixth Dimension is excellent. Superman and Batman win not through paranoia and cynicism, but through trust and friendship, through defying Perpetua's ideals instead of sacrificing their own. At the start of this project, I talked about Tower of Babel, a story centered on the fact that Batman doesn't trust his friends and makes contingencies to defeat them if he has to. But that was more than 20 years ago. Bruce has grown since then. He trusts Clark more than anything. Batman says he thinks the World Forger was right, but he trusts Superman because he's his friend and makes him believe in things he can't on his own. The era of Tower of Babel and Identity Crisis and the OMAC project ended a long time ago, and quite honestly, I like stories where Batman and Superman are friends more than ones where they hate each other. The last story we're going to discuss here today is Batman Failsafe by Chip Zdarsky. But before we can talk about this story, we need to talk about Batman Rip by Grant Morrison. And before we can talk about that, we need to talk about two Silver Age stories. In the 1958 story, Batman the Superman of Planet X, Batman is transported to an alien planet where Batman is Superman. This Batman is called the Batman of Zurinar and has a colorful costume. During Morrison's run, it was revealed that this story and a bunch of other Silver Age stories were things that Batman hallucinated while high as shit. The other story that inspired Rip is the 1963 Batman issue Robin Dies at Dawn, in which Robin fights a supervillain with shrinking powers named Ant-Man, because I guess Marvel didn't know the copyright law existed at the time. Go down to the comments and write what you assume happens next in this issue. Whatever you wrote is wrong, because what happens next 
is Batman decides to undergo a military experiment to test the psychological strain isolated astronauts face in deep space. Then, because it's the Silver Age, it ends with Batman dressing up like a gorilla to fight other men dressed like gorillas. What does this have to do with anything? Well, in Morrison's run, this unnamed psychologist was given the name Thomas Wayne, but he isn't Batman's dad. He's Batman's immortal ancestor who worships the dark god Barbados, who is actually real and was created by the World Forger. In the story, Batman Rip. Wait, is it Batman Rip or Batman R.I.P.? It's probably Batman R.I.P. In the story, Batman R.I.P., it is revealed that Tommy Boy got a job with NASA so he could do a Manchurian candidate on Batman. Then, 45 years later, after the universe was destroyed and recreated, he drugs Batman and says the code word, causing Batman to lose his memories. Batman then makes a new red, purple, and yellow costume and starts calling himself the Batman of Zurinar. It's revealed that Batman brainwashed himself into having a split personality so that, if he ever got attacked mentally, he could switch over to the other personality. Unfortunately, the other personality is a violent asshole with a tenuous grasp on reality. Eventually, Batman snaps out of it. At the start of the failsafe arc, Penguin fakes his death and frames Batman for murdering him. This causes the activation of failsafe, a killer robot Batman built while in a Zurinar fugue state. Failsafe is designed to kill Batman if he ever becomes a murderer. That's right, as Tim points out later in the story, Batman's contingency made a contingency! Fortunately, that contingency made a contingency for if his contingency ever got out of hand. Alfred was told about Failsafe and given the ability to shut it down if it ever activated wrongly. Unfortunately, Thomas Wayne, no not that one, the one who's Batman's dad except from a different timeline where he's Batman, was transported to the main universe by the Reverse Flash, who saved his life because he hates him for interrupting his Lola Bunny monologue because he knows he would feel sad about his son being Batman. Anyway, he teamed up with Bane and murdered Alfred so that Bruce would give up on being Batman, then Bane broke Batman's back, but not that Batman, this one, who is Thomas Wayne, but not that Thomas Wayne, and only kind of this Thomas Wayne. Anyway, the important thing is that Batman's dad murdered Batman's other dad, and now failsafe can't be turned off. Damn it! If only Batman's contingency had created a contingency for his contingency's contingency! Failsafe attacks Batman and beats him to a bloody pulp. Batman's kids show up and Failsafe defeats them. By the way, I really love Jorge Jimenez's art, both in this story and in The Sixth Dimension. Also, shout out to Tommy Mori's coloring, which is half the reason this book looks so good. Tim takes Batman back to the Batcave and Batman monologues that, in his younger days, he was less soft and went too far. The story flashes back to that scene in Tower of Babel where Batman said that his contingency for himself if he ever goes evil is the Justice League. And by that scene in Tower of Babel, I mean that scene in Justice League Doom, because that scene didn't happen in the comics. Superman points out that the Justice League being able to stop Batman, who has planned to stop all of them, is stupid. This presumably inspired Zurinar to create Failsafe. Back in the present, Batman puts on the Zurinar costume and lets his other personality take over. Zurinar explains everything to Tim. Failsafe attacks Zurinar and Tim, almost killing the latter. The robot says the fighting it causes Batman's family pain. Zurinar says that Robin isn't family, he's a soldier, and leaves Tim for dead so he can continue fighting. Seeing Zurinar abandon his son pisses Bruce off so much that he takes back control of his body. The story kind of made a click for me why I don't like Frank Miller's version of Batman. Because the Batman who appears in All-Star Batman isn't Bruce Wayne. He's Zurinar. Zurinar is Batman without any humanity, a brutal, ruthless thug who doesn't care about anyone. He kills people for fun and thinks he's the coolest person on the planet. He treats his sidekicks, not his family, but his soldiers to be beaten and abused to make them stronger. Hell, in the most recent story of Zdarsky's run, it's revealed that every version of Batman has a Zurinar, including Miller's Batman. Zurinar is a bastard and, unfortunately, a lot of bad writers have Batman be Zurinar instead of Bruce. Zurinar is the type of man who would murder Superman if there was only a 1% chance he was evil. The type of man who would build a spy satellite and plot to fight other heroes. The type of man who would sentence trillions to a hell prison so he could live in a better world. I really like the idea of having Zurinar be this living embodiment of Batman's negative traits. His paranoia, his ruthlessness, his lust for power. Zurinar is the man Batman could become, but with hope, never will. Batman charges in, knowing he can't win, but unwilling to let anyone else die because of him. Batman is about to die, lying in the burning remains of Wayne Manor, when his closest friend comes to save the day. Superman. 
Unfortunately, that prick Zeranar equipped failsafe with kryptonite knives, including one hidden in its back that almost kills Superman. The rest of the League shows up, giving Batman a chance to pull the knife out of Superman's stomach. Robin and Green Arrow drag Batman and Superman onto the Javelin. Failsafe leads the League to Gotham, where Batman has hidden a special magnet that works on Hot Girl's wings, flamethrowers for Martian Manhunter, and an oxygen mask thingy for Black Canary. Green Arrow asks what his counter is. It's, it's the big fucking robot, Ollie. As the Javelin is flying over the ocean, Bruce realizes that Failsafe is tracking him. If Failsafe reaches them, Superman won't get medical attention, and the world needs Superman. Bruce tells Tim he's proud of him, and jumps out into the dark sea. Batman is saved from drowning by Aquaman. He wakes up two weeks later and is told that Failsafe has taken over Gotham, transforming it into a police state and taking his kids prisoner. Failsafe comes for Atlantis and Aquaman rallies his army to protect Batman. One soldier asks why he can't just hand over Batman. Aquaman asks, how many times have you saved the planet? Because Batman's done it like 50 times, so shut the fuck up! Batman monologues that Arthur is a good man and wonders if the people he saves can really make up for the suffering he brings to his loved ones. I really like this arc's focus on the respect Batman and the rest of the League have for one another. The version of Batman who jumps out of the plane isn't the version who created Failsafe, and the version who created Failsafe isn't the type of man who Aquaman will go to war to protect. Batman teleports to the Watchtower. Failsafe defeats Aquaman and chases after Batman. Batman damages Failsafe's outer armor with a new Genesis super laser and teleports the robot back to Earth. Unfortunately, this blows up the Watchtower, sending Batman plummeting through space. Don't worry, Batman's costume is also a spacesuit and can survive the pressures of deep space, I guess. Batman survives falling from orbit in what is easily the least realistic time Batman survived falling from a high height. Like, I get that his cape is a parachute and he fell into the snow, but how the hell did he survive getting set on fire during re-entry? It's dumb, but the story's good enough that I'm going to ignore the fact that it's really, really dumb. Batman conveniently lands outside the Fortress of Solitude right as Superman wakes up. Superman flies out for a rematch, but Failsafe takes him out by using pressure points to make his heat vision backfire. This contingency is the last one this video will feature, bringing our list to a total of 77 contingencies. This one, like a lot of Failsafe's contingencies, is simple but effective. Batman figures out he can defeat Failsafe by stabbing nanobots into the hole he made. He boasts that Failsafe was designed to defeat Batman, but doesn't stand a chance against Batman and Robin. Batman's love for Tim in this scene is a really nice character moment, but like, Failsafe took out the Justice League. It is capable of fighting multiple people at once. Batman injects the nanobots, shutting Failsafe down, but with its last moments, the robot pulls out a gun and vaporizes Batman. And by vaporizes, I mean, banishes him to another universe somehow? This video is going to end up being a bit incomplete because while I was writing it, Zdarsky brought back Failsafe. In the current arc, Failsafe is possessed by Zuran R, who's planning to take over the world and transform it into a police state. Presumably he'll lose because, you know, the whole point is that this is the bad type of Batman that Batman has to overcome, and now it's just physical because he has a robot body. Regardless, it's time for a ranking. Of the 77 plans I talked about, there were about 14 that I thought were okay, and 25 that I thought were absurdly bad. These plans are scrolling across the screen now. Remember that one? Wasn't it dumb? Oh, and that one? Super deadly. At this point, I'm just stalling so they can uh, all scroll by. Uh, let's give it a second. Before we get into the top fives, let's talk about some interesting factoids. The hero with the most contingencies is Superman, no shit, with a whopping 19 different plans. Green Lantern comes in second with eight, and the top five is rounded out by Flash with seven, Martian Manhunter with six, and a tie between Wonder Woman and Black Canary with four. Based on my rankings of the stories I talked about, the one with the most consistently bad plans was actually Tower of Babel, although a lot of that is due to this page, which features four different heroes who Batman flat out does not have a plan for. The best, surprisingly, was DC Universe Online, which took the plans from Tower of Babel, but cut out some of the really bad ones and replaced them with new good ones. Let's start with some honorable mentions. For the good plans, this includes Eternal VR Battle, Wonder Woman, Tower of Babel, Tear Gas, Black Canary, DC Universe Online, EMP, Red Tornado, DC Universe Online, Throat Punch, Zatanna, DC Universe Online, The Justice League, Batman, Doom, 
Four versus one. Superman, the Dark Knight strikes again. Fenrir armor. General, endgame. Water absorbent foam. Aquaman, endgame. Special magnet. Hawk girl, fail safe. And for the bad ones, the honorable mentions include Black Hole Compression, The Atom, Tower of Babel, Hammer Jamming, Steel, Tower of Babel, Paralysis, Flash, DC Universe Online, Speed Bomb, Flash, Doom, Electrified Net, Hawkman, Lost Powers, Kryptonite Laser, Superman, Lost Powers, Mother Box, Cyborg, Forever Evil, Kryptonite Knives, Superman, Fail Safe, and Yellow Lantern Weapons, Green Lantern, Kill the Justice League. Let's do the good plans first. Number five is Liquid Nitrogen Shattering from Tower of Babel. This plan is brutal and gets Batman kicked out of the League, but I have to admit it was effective. Plastic Man is completely incapacitated in an instant and is fine a few hours later. This is the most effective plan from the original Tower of Babel. Number four is Oxygen Limiting Mask from Failsafe. Unlike the other Black Canary contingencies, we get to see this one in action. An automatic drone locks onto Dinah's face, keeping her from screaming, and as a bonus, leaving her too weak to fight. Number three is the final bat suit from the Sixth Dimension. The armor from The Dark Knight Returns and the Fenrir suit from Endgame keep Batman from being turned into a pace by the League, but both of those suits are torn apart halfway through the battle. The final bat suit is Batman's strongest armor and allows him to hold off the entire League at once. What's more, its mind rewriting abilities mean Batman doesn't even need to fight. This is Batman's most effective contingency, but I didn't feel right putting it any higher than number three, because Batman didn't technically make it. I mean, it was made by a future version of Batman, who is still Batman, but not the current Batman. The, the point is, it's going into number three. Number two is the Blind of Veils from Endgame. Of Batman's three attempts to attack Wonder Woman mentally, this one is the best. Tossing a rope on Diana is easier than having a robot crawl inside of her ear and attack her brain. Plus, unlike the hallucination causing toxin from Doom, this one actually immobilizes her. The fact that it was created by Hephaestus to be a perfect counter to the Lasso of Truth implies, to me at least, that the Blind of Veils is an incredibly potent mind controller, one Wonder Woman wouldn't be able to break free of easily. And in number one, we have the Phantom Zone from DC Universe Online. This plan was made for Firestorm, but honestly, it works on pretty much any threat. Temporarily dump them into a nearly inescapable pocket dimension, punch the villain with mind control in the face, then let the hero out. It's simple, it's effective, and it's non-lethal. This is the best contingency, and it appears as a single line in an MMO. Now for the bad ones. Except, I lied last time when I said I would do the five worst. I couldn't get the list down to five, so instead I'm doing the ten worst, or... Really, the 17 worst. For number 10, I'm lumping together six different plans. Or, more accurately, six different lack of plans. Batman's plans for Big Barda, Mr. Miracle, Orion, and Red Rocket and Tower of Babel, for Wonder Woman and Forever Evil, and for himself and Kill the Justice League, flat out do not exist. And to be fair, Batman doesn't have contingencies for most superheroes. But I mean, when you take the time to set up a briefcase with Wonder Woman's logo on it, but don't actually put a plan in it, it becomes clear that the lack of plan is not from a lack of trying, but from a lack of competence. Wonder Woman is the worst non-plan, I'd say, because Batman knows her the best, needs a plan for her the most, and most importantly, already had a plan in Tower of Babel. Like, she'd be more prepared, but I don't see how she could counter a robot in her brain messing with her senses. Number nine is Box of Matches from the New Frontier. Was it a joke? Yes. But to be clear, it would take so much more than a box of matches to defeat John. Number eight is Red Kryptonite from Tower of Babel. This plan worked, but that's only because Batman got lucky. Having your plan rely on some random, unpredictable bullshit happening to Superman is risky, when there's a high probability that the random bullshit just makes him stronger. Number seven is Yellow Paint from All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. Do, do I have to explain this one? Number six is Kryptonite Bullet Suicide from Doom. Not only does this one only work if Superman isn't evil, it would kill him. Number five is a tie between Brother Eye from the OMAC Project and Failsafe from Failsafe. The fact that I have to be specific when I say, remember that time Batman created an evil AI designed to defeat superheroes and then it almost killed him is a bad sign. I'm not sure what's worse, building Skynet or building the Terminator. Either way, Batman doing so was a massive misstep. 
Number four is Fortune Sabotage from Tower of Babel. This is, without a doubt, the plan least capable of succeeding on this list. Oliver Queen lost his fortune and it made him a better hero. Update your plans, Batman! Number three is Sinestro Core Ring from Forever Evil. This one didn't work, and quite frankly, I don't know why Batman thought it would. Why would you think that Hal couldn't beat a weaker version of the guy he regularly beats? Number two is Hypnotic Blindness from Tower of Babel. This one only works if Kyle is already asleep. That's a bit of a problem for a plan designed to defeat him when he's awake and attacking Batman. This plan is overcomplicated, ignores the option of just hitting him in the head while he's asleep, and doesn't even disarm him. It's dumb. It's... it's so dumb! And at number one, the worst plan Batman ever came up with is the Cheetah Hallucinations from Doom. Making Wonder Woman think that you're someone she hates and wants to kill is not a good strategy. All it does is ensure that she won't hold back as she rips you limb from limb. Worse, this plan results in dozens of bystanders being injured, if not killed. Wonder Woman ripped off Cyborg's arm and kicked him hard enough to break an armored car. If she did that to any of the civilians she attacked, they are now dead. Batman's plan to stop Wonder Woman, if she goes evil and starts killing people, is to make her more willing to kill people! There we have it. 77 plans, like a dozen of which were vaguely good. So, to answer the question I posed at the start of this, could Batman beat anyone in a fight? No! What? What? Why are you still asking that? I just spent two hours explaining why he couldn't. What? How, how do you think he can still beat Goku? Goku doesn't even have an easily exploited weakness like Kryptonite to use. How is this a debate? Anyway, that's the end of the video. Be sure to subscribe because me like when number get bigger. I make video essays, comedy skits, and D&D storytime videos. I plan to make that Silver Age World's finest video eventually, although I don't know when. In April, I plan to release a very, very long video on why the Homestuck epilogues are bad fanfiction. I also have a secondary gaming channel where I respond to comments while playing Pokemon that you should check out. Later this year, I intend to release the first part of what I expect to be a five-part miniseries covering the politics of various Batman adaptations, beginning with Batman the Animated Series. Till then, I've been Casey Jarms, and I, uh... I really need to get a proper outro.